Well, good morning. My name is Ian Wildeboer, and I'm pastor at Mercy Church in East Hamilton. And I have the opportunity this morning to read uh, scripture with you, but also to uh, preach the gospel. And I just want to give you a bit of a context to what we're doing for the next three weeks. And, and that is we're going to follow this theme uh, that's on the screen here, uh, going the right way in a wrong way world. We decided that we would follow this uh, theme. This is a series that we started in January in uh, at Mercy Church, sorry, at Mercy Church. And uh, we're going to continue that series um, for the next number of weeks. And for the next three weeks, uh, Pastor Bill Hilmer and I are hoping to look at spiritual disciplines. Now, spiritual disciplines are um, spiritual practices or habits that we have that um, build our character, that help us to grow spiritually. And so we're going to look at these spiritual disciplines, and I'm going to be looking at the first one, which is um, giving to the needy, the spiritual act of giving. And the second one will be prayer, and the third will be fasting. And that's what will be happening over the next few weeks. Well, to get us into that context, into the story of today that I hope to preach on, I want to open our Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, that's where we find the story of Cornelius. Uh, it's a fascinating story. I, I hope if you have some time today, you can actually read the whole story. We're just going to read the first eight verses of Acts chapter 10. And um, it's a story about a man named Cornelius who's actually a God-fearer, which means he's not a Christian yet. He f believes in the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he has yet to come to know Jesus and the way of forgiveness. And um, that's what's going to happen in this story, but at the beginning he just is introduced to, to the angel of the Lord who um, is going to call out for help for him. So let us read Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. There we read these words. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. And he distinctly saw an angel of God who, who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's one of, he's one of the apostles. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel had spoke to him, had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. This is the word of the Lord. Now, um, as we turn back into Matthew, the first gospel of the New Testament, we're going to enter what they call the Sermon on the Mount, which is where we got our series from, Going the Right Way in a Wrong Way World. And we're about halfway now in the series, in chapter 6. Chapter 5, um, just at the end of these, the verses, the last 20 verses, it's been really focused on you know, your call, your commitment to your neighbor. How do you love your neighbor? And as we move into chapter 6 now, we're going to be looking more at uh, our piety, our devotion to Christ, our devotion to God. And we begin there in verse 6, and this is, this is the text for today, and this is what we're going to be focusing on today. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Well, loved ones in Jesus Christ, you may be wondering, 
You know, why would we be picking a text like this in the midst of COVID-19 when there's so much economic disparity and, and the economy is um, going down, people are losing their jobs, and people have a hard time paying their rent? Why would you speak about giving at this time of, the, of, of, of our season through COVID? Well, partly because this is providential. This is where we are in our series but I also think that this is really a, a timely message as well. Christ is not telling us how much we need to give or how much they gave. He, giving is, is something that is a matter of the heart, and that's what we're focusing on here. But at the same time, I, I think you know, there's been something really heavy on my heart the last few weeks, and I think this would be shared with other pastors. And that is, you know, for the church, how, how do we serve well in the time of isolation? How do we be church in this time? How do we have hearts that are committed to the, the cause of Christ and the needs of others? You know, our worry, I guess, as pastors, and my worry personally, is that possibly that as we isolate ourselves, that we, we grow kind of cold uh, to the needs of others, that we become a little bit more self-absorbed and, and our own needs be, just become ma- maximized, you could say. How do, we, how do we have a heart for our city, for the poor, for the hurting, when, when we also have our own burdens now in isolation? What does it mean to, to pray for our city? What does it mean for God to open up opportunities to, to be Christ to our city? And the reason I say this is because there is a, a burden, a, 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 a pain, you could say, a collective pain that people are experiencing right now because of COVID-19. Some of you know the writer, author, David Brooks. He works, writes for New York Times. He's written a few books. He wrote an open column. And before he wrote this open column, he just sent out a, a question to his, the reading audience, and he asked them just you know, a few questions. He said, how are you doing? And in particular, how is your mental health during this crisis? And this is what he writes. He says, I, I don't know what I expected. Maybe some jaunty stories about families pulling together in a crisis. He said to his readers, what you sent me gutted me. There have been over 5,000 replies so far, he says. While many people are hanging in there, there is also a river of woe running through the world. A significant portion of our friends and neighbors are in agony. And then he goes, these little synopsis, these little stories, one after another from people all over the states, dealing with anxiety, dealing with fear, dealing with depression, dealing with loneliness, dealing with poverty. It's enough to bring tears to your eyes. One of the stories he shares of an, of an atheist who wrote in who said, I, I pray daily, but I just don't know to whom. I hope and pray that Christ will reveal himself to this man or woman. But this is, this is our time. This is where the church is called uh, to action. And what does it mean as members of Christ's church to, to activate and to live this ministry of mercy in this time to a hurting world? Well, I like to look at this theme this morning. The broad theme is going the right way in a wrong way world. Of course, that way is Christ. But I like to look at this particular theme this morning is the right way to give. The right way to give. And what I mean by giving, that's the word that we find in our text. Um, the context or the words that are used to giving to the needy is actually showing mercy. The word mercy is in that word giving to the needy. It kind of, it's a merciful action that we're showing, merciful deeds, pitiful, actions that show that we're showing pity to, to people. That kind of mercy is what is talked about here. So how do we give? How do we show that mercy? Well, I have three things that I'd like to look at this morning. First is this, uh, giving to those in need is a Christian duty. Giving to those in need is a Christian duty. And secondly, giving exposes the motivation of your heart. And giving is a response to God's extravagant mercy for you. But let's begin. Giving to those in need is a Christian duty. It's important to realize that as Jesus is speaking here, he's assuming that um, people will practice righteousness 
And he's assuming that people will give to the needy. He begins in verse 1. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And then he begins in verse 2. So when you then give to the needy, so the practice of righteousness is assumed on the followers, those believers in God, and that practice of righteousness is kind of what we would call ethical behavior. It's not the righteousness that some of us know that is imputed to us because when Christ died on the cross, he imputed his righteousness, righteousness to us so that we're declared righteous. That's not what Jesus is talking about particularly in this text. No, he's talking about our Christian deeds, our, our godly deeds. In, in, as a citizen of the kingdom, when you practice those good deeds, and then he's saying, basically, um, that's expected of you. It's expected of you to, to, to pray. It's expected of you to fast. It's expected that you will give to the needy. And the listeners at this time would not be surprised by um, Jesus saying, um, talking about practicing your righteousness or when you give to the needy, not if. But when, they would, be, they would understand that this is part of their Christian or this, their religious practice. It really does, um, if you understand the Old Testament, it is, it is a duty, uh, 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 an obligation, you could say, upon God's people to care for those who are in need. I'm just going to read you a few texts to, to point that picture out very, very clearly to you. The first comes from Deuteronomy chapter 15. It talks about slaves and, and their freedom. But in particular, I want to read verse 7. It says, If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, uh, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. So, so be generous, God is saying. And we sang um, Psalm 41. Psalm 41, verse 1 says, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. And there's more psalms that, that show God's compassion and God's heart for the poor. Proverbs 19, verse 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Proverbs 30, 21, verse 13 says, Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. This is, this is an Old Testament you know, picture of what God's heart is for the poor. And we get the same picture in the New Testament. In Galatians 2, verse 10, this is Paul referring to something that's come from Jerusalem now. He says, All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. And then we got that text from James 1, verse 27. Religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Why do I share all those texts? Because that's God's heart. And nothing has changed throughout history. God has a compassion. He has compassion for the poor. He has compassion for the brokenhearted, for the needy, for the orphan, for the widow, for those who have experienced injustice. And I need you to understand that, that we are God's vehicle, God's agents of mercy. Each one of us have a minist has a ministry of mercy to this world, to the brokenness, to the hurting, even those involved in COVID-19 who are struggling because of it. And in some ways, this is our time. This is the church's time to rise up and to show that love, that heart of God to the people who are hurting. In our city in particular, it's Hamilton. In your city, it might be Burlington or wherever it is. To find venues, to find opportunities to, to help those who are lonely, to help those who are struggling financially, who cannot make ends meet, who cannot pay their rent, who cannot put food on the table. There's different options here in Hamilton, like City Kids, Micah House, food banks. Because we can't let this time pass us over.
So the question is, how do we want to be remembered as a church post-COVID-19? Do we want to be remembered as a church that, that showed compassion, that, that showed kindness in a time of need, in desperation, that river of woe that we talked about? Michael Gove, a British politician, this is before the crisis, of course, um, shared these words. He says, The reality of Christian mission in today's churches is a story of a thousands of quiet kindnesses. In many of our most disadvantaged communities, it's the churches that provide warmth, food, fellowship, and support for individuals who have fallen on the worst of times. You see, it's our duty of care as a household of faith to, to show our love for those in the household who are struggling and then go outside in these kind of ever-widening circles into the needs of our community. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. It's our Christian duty to show love. It's our Christian duty to give to those in need. But there is a right way and a wrong way, and that's the second thing I want to talk about this morning. Giving exposes the motivation of your heart. There's a story, and maybe this is particular for you children. I want you to track with me in this story. There's a story, children, of, a, of an older woman, an elderly woman. We're going to call her uh, Aunt Tilda. I don't know if you have an Aunt Tilda. Probably not. Well, Aunt Tilda is an elderly woman, and she's extremely wealthy. Aunt Tilda has a nephew, we're going to call him George, who's very kind to her, to his old aunt. Whatever he, she asks of him, he does. He, he visits her. But he want, she wants to test his kindness. So one day she comes up with this idea. She, she gets rid of her beautiful garb and she puts on ragtag clothes and makes her hair disheveled and, and um, becomes unrecognizable. Looks like she's a street agent or a worker. And, he, and she, she comes to his house when he's gone to work and she sits on the front porch and waits for him to come home. Well, nephew George finally rocks up or comes home and, and he looks at her and doesn't recognize her and is very unkind to her. And he tells her, get out of here. What are you doing on my property? And she leaves. I wonder, children, what Aunt Tilda thought about her nephew now. I think she realizes that the love that she was receiving from her nephew was connected to her wealth and that he didn't actually care for the hurting. He didn't care for the poor. He didn't really care for her either. And that picture is a little bit like the picture that Jesus is talking about here with these Pharisees or scribes, we don't know exactly who they are, but we know they're hypocrites, who actually don't care about the poor, who don't have a heart for those who are in need. And this is what Jesus says in verse 2. He says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. Do not be honored by others. To be honored by others, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. You know, this might be somewhat comical to, to have a trumpet in a synagogue blasting off. Doo, 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 doo. Could you imagine in school, someone comes into your classroom and blows a trumpet and says, I'm giving this away. Well, maybe Jesus is speaking with exaggerated speech here. The fact is, is that they're, that they're acting. They're hypocrites. They want the attention whether it was actually used to draw the poor together and so they could thank the benefactor, the one who gave them all their money, or it was just a way to say, you're doing everything possible to make people look at you and say, I like that guy, he's really generous, or he's really kind, or that woman, she's so caring. Jesus says, well, they received their reward. They got what they wanted. What did they want? I'll tell you what they wanted. 
They wanted more likes on Facebook. They wanted more likes on Instagram or more followers on Twitter. They wanted the community to talk about them, to say good things about them, to have their names written in stone for future generations to say, Brother George was a, was a generous man. And Jesus says they got what they wanted, they got their reward. And that reward is, is a, a, an interesting word, it's, it's, it's a transactional word, it's a word that, that's connected to buying and selling, and so when you get your, your, your thing that you want, and the person gives you the receipt, the action is all done, it's a closed deal, that's the idea. The deal has been closed. No final reward. They got the reward, they got the recognition. But I worry that we also fall into this trap very easily. We do things for the sole worship of people, not God. Not to worship God, but to seek the applause of people. I believe this temptation hits everyone. Hits me as well. It's the sin of self-promotion. It's alive and well in the church as well. It's the sin of self-exaltation. It's the sin of deflection where we deflect the glory that's due Christ and we bring it on to ourselves. Look at what I've done. Like what I've done. Like the gifts I have, my time, the things I've shared. Like it, love it, share it. Let people know how good I am. But the fear is and the worry here is that we've already received our reward then. The transaction is closed. That we may be missing out on something more beautiful if we had just surrendered all of that desire for approval to, to stand in the audience of one and seek His praise, His blessing. Now this is not to say that words of appreciation are not good and needed in season. We need encouragement to spur us on. A word of thanks emboldens us. But the point is that we're not to go and find it. Let those words of appreciation and thanks for what you're doing find you. You don't find them. That's what Jesus is teaching. Well, some of you who are astute are going to come back and say to me, well, pastor, if you go back about 30 verses into chapter 5, 15, or chapter 5, verse 16, you're going to read these words. Matthew 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Is there a conflict between here, this, these verses, and what Jesus is talking about, about doing things in secret? Uh, no, there's no conflict. We are to let our light shine, and we are to let our good deeds shine. We give until it forces us to sacrifice something and we give more and we continue to give and we continue to bless people and we continue to show our love to people. These are all good deeds, but we do it in such a way that when people look at it and people observe, observe what we're doing, they immediately want to glorify God. It causes them to break the knee and worship the Creator and the sustainer. we got to get out of the way. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. To get, just get out of the way. How do we get out of the way? He says, well, here, here's, this is how you get out of the way. Matthew 6, verse 3, it says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that, you, that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He said, well, that's impossible unless you're Olaf, to not know what your left hand is doing from your right. I'm not Olaf. Of course your right hand is going to know what your left hand is doing. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying this. He says, give. Give generously. Pour out your heart. Show that love. And then keep the feet moving. Don't get stuck. Don't look back. And say, wow, well, well, look at all the good things I've done and begin to give with one hand and pat your back hand with the other, pat your back with the other hand. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, do it in secret, forget about it. I like how John, John Stott says, he says, Christian giving is to be marked by self-sacrifice and self-forgetfulness, not by self-congratulation. Or John Calvin the reformer. 
In the 1500s, he says, we ought to be satisfied with having God for our only witness. I wonder, are you satisfied? Are you content to know that God observed your good deeds and no one else? I've always been moved by the story of the centurion. Somehow, even before he come, came to know Christ as his Redeemer and Savior, and I hope you know Christ as your Redeemer and Savior, but even before he came to know Jesus as his Redeemer and Savior, he was doing things like this, just serving God in secret, blessing people in secret. He practiced, as we learn in chapter 10 of Acts, at least two spiritual disciplines and did them well. The discipline of prayer, he prayed regularly and he gave regularly. And he gave generously, we read. And, and we learn in chapter 10 of, of Acts that these came up to God as memorial offerings. And that idea of a memorial offering, in that word memorial, is the word remember. So God received his, his gifts as an offering that, that he remembers. That's so beautiful. And I wonder if you're giving and serving in this way that, that God takes notice and remembers it. Maybe everybody else forgets. In fact, you should be the one forgetting it, but God doesn't. And so I ask you, are your gifts, whether it's giving of your time or your resources to help those who are in need, are, are, they, are they going to the throne room as a memorial offering to be remembered by the one who's formed you and fashioned you and then to be quickly forgotten by, the, by you, the giver of the gift? And this brings me to the final point. Giving is a response to God's extravagant mercy for you. Giving exposes the heart, but it, it is a response to God's extravagant mercy for you. And the question that we need to ask is this, what motivates a follower of Christ to give generously? Without any fanfare, without any applause. He's not a philanthropist. He's just someone who wants to give. I think the simple answer to that question is Christ. What motivates a, a follower of Christ to give generously is Christ. But let's, let's flesh that out a little bit. You see, although giving or showing mercy is a command of God, the act cannot simply be a response to a demand. We, we can't just do something out of duty and think that that's going to carry itself. It has to arise from a heart that has, that has received mercy, that understands mercy. Because if if it's done out of duty, it will soon wane. Or you'll begin to, to look at, in pride at other people who are not giving out of duty or not giving at all, and you're thinking, well, look at me. I'm just such a better person than that person. But your heart is in the wrong place. Or sometimes we give out of the twin sisters of duty, which is shame and guilt. But if you're giving out of shame and, and, and guilt, it, it, it's not going to become habitual. But more than that, it's going to be spiritually impoverished. There's going to be bitterness in there. There's going to be envy in there. There's going to be jealousy in there because the motivation is not pure. And neither do we give based on the worthiness of the recipient because soon we'll find out that that recipient is really not that worthy after all. That's not what Christ desires of us. You see, the act of showing pity or mercy to those in need is rooted in someone who first met your need. Who took on your bankruptcy. Who bore your poverty. His name is Jesus. I wonder if you have grasped the extravagant mercy that God has already shown to you in Jesus. It's fitting, it's very fitting that Jesus does not start the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 about giving to the needy in the proper way. No, he actually begins in chapter 5 
with bankruptcy. Spiritual bankruptcy. That's what he says. Blessed are the poor. Chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a spiritual bankruptcy. That word poverty or poor is bankruptcy. You have no resources within yourself to win God's favor or to earn his grace. You're spiritually bankrupt. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It means, it means you're weeping over your sins. You're, you're, you're realizing your desperate need for grace. You're realizing that your works are what Isaiah says in chapter 64, verse 6, you know, are like filthy rags before a holy God. It, it just doesn't add up. That's something beautiful. What about this thought experiment? Imagine you met a decrepit, homeless person who's smelly and bed raggled and, and, and nothing recommends, recommends him to you. Well, that's God's eyes on us. Nothing recommends us to God. Or this, what do you see when you see a prostitute, an alcoholic, a prisoner, a drug addict, an unwed mother, or a homeless person? Do you see yourself in them? Spiritually, that's who you are before a holy God. And here's the message of grace to you, because this fuels a proper heart of giving. Here's the message of grace to you. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. It says these words, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you may become rich. That's rich. That's grace. Him taking on our filthy rags of an impoverished, polluted spirit. Him choosing to wear our soiled clothes of impurity. Him bearing our shame of works defiled by a web of deceit and ill-gotten gain. He took on our poverty so that He could make us rich. He rescued us, He redeemed us, and He promised us eternal life. That all happened on the cross, which we celebrated two weeks ago. And it's what motivates us to get up every morning and show the love of Christ to people and be generous with the gifts God has given us and the resources he has given us. The enduring motivation to give to those in need is a fresh experience of God's grace to you. And I ask you this morning, have you experienced that grace to you? If so, if you know that you've experienced that grace, that although you were, that he was, although he was rich, he became poor for you, so that you could become rich. If you've experienced that great exchange, give generously. Show it to the world, not to gain rewards of men or women, but the reward that God promises in secret. We're not sure exactly what he means by that reward in secret in chapter 6. It may be a reward that when God rewards us, he may be um, showing showing us the joy of a met need when we give to someone who is in need. There's joy in that. It may be the joy of getting other opportunities to serve. It, It may be the joy of God filling our hearts with joy because because we are serving him in such a beautiful way. But it might also mean the reward that awaits his children for our good deeds do follow us into glory. You see, when Jesus comes back, and we learn this later in Matthew, we're going to close with this. When Jesus comes back, he knows what we've done. I don't have time to read all of Matthew 5. This sermon is coming to its close. But I'm just going to read three verses from Matthew 25. This is the return of Christ. and This is what we learn about his return. He's going to separate those who are followers of him and those who are not, those who have served him and surrendered their will, who have lived out of grace, and those who have rejected him. And we get in verse 34, these words, he says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger 
and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And, and the righteous were going to look at this and they're going to be incredulous. They're going to have no idea really what he's talking about. He's like, like when did this all happen? Because our feet were moving, we don't remember. He says, when you did it to the least of my brothers and my sisters, you did it also to me. And then he's going to say to them, come into the joy of your master. Come into this kingdom. Loved ones, we, we are called... We are called to do things in secret, but motivated by a heart that's been moved by the abundance of His grace to us. And then as we live that life out, out of grace, showing the love of Christ, giving to those who are in need, even when it hurts, it comes up as a memorial offering to God. He remembers, and by His grace, he decides to reward us. And that reward is eternal. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that Christ teaches us really how to give. As the one who gave his life for us so that we could live eternally. He's given us more than we can ask or imagine. He's given us his very life and Lord, we pray that you will help us experience the grace that we have and what he's given us and lavish that grace and lavish that love to others. Lord, we thank you for the resources that you've given us. Some you've given many, some little. But help us to give with generous hearts, fulfilling our Christian duty, but doing it because we love you. And we love the, the, the people of this world and we want to help and we want to show your love to them. Drive our motivations with purity and holiness coming from your word, we pray. And for the love that you work in our lives. We thank you for this gospel and we thank you for the hope we have. May you be blessed and honored by our actions, our good deeds in your service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.